Bronze Age swords look brutal and battle ready, so why do so many of them have barely any handguard? The answer isn't, they forgot. It's that their whole fighting setup made big crossguards way less necessary. Number one, the shield was the handguard. If you're picturing a classic medieval knight sword, you're probably also picturing a long crossguard that sticks out like a little T. That shape makes you assume the hand is constantly at risk. But a lot of Bronze Age sword fighting in Europe likely didn't work like two people standing there trading sword blocks. For many warriors, the real protective system wasn't built into the sword at all. It was the shield. In a lot of Bronze Age contexts, especially in parts of Northern and Western Europe, the common shield style seems to have been a center grip shield. Basically, a round shield with a handle behind a central boss. Simple idea, huge effect. When you hold that kind of shield out in front of you and strike with a sword from behind it, your sword hand is often tucked behind the shield's edge from your opponent's point of view. Your hand is in the shadow of the shield. So when people ask, why didn't they add more hand protection? One answer is, they already had it, just not on the sword. And that also explains something people notice when they handle replicas. Many Bronze Age swords feel like they want to work with a shield. They're often balanced and shaped for quick, committed cuts and short thrusts from behind cover, not for endless blade-on-blade -blade fencing. Now fast forward to the Middle Ages, and you can see why this matters. Medieval soldiers and knights didn't all use the same shield style forever. Over time in medieval warfare, you see more strapped shields, where the shield is attached to the forearm, and later smaller shields. And in a lot of situations, the sword hand ends up sticking out past the shield's protection more often. When your hand isn't naturally hidden anymore, the sword starts needing to do more of the guarding job itself. That's not the only reason guards evolve, but it's a big part of the story. With Bronze Age kit, the shield was doing a lot of the boring, practical work that a cross guard later helps with, and that changes what seems necessary. Number two, a guard isn't only for enemy blades. Another thing that messes with our expectations is what we think a guard is for. People usually imagine the cross guard as a mini fence that stops an opponent's sword sliding down into your fingers. That does happen in later sword systems, but guards also solve other problems, and some of those problems were already handled in Bronze Age designs in different ways. First, the most basic job, stopping your own hand from slipping forward onto the blade. That matters most when thrusting, because your hand wants to keep moving. Even a small lip or flare at the base of the blade can help, and a lot of Bronze Age swords do have modest shaping around that area, plus grips that give traction. Second, protecting your knuckles from impact. In sword and shield fighting, your weapon hand is constantly near hard edges. Your own shield rim, your opponent's shield rim, spear shafts, bits of armor, even just the chaos of bodies pushing close. A big cross guard helps, sure, but so does simply keeping the hand behind the shield and having a grip that doesn't encourage overextension. Third, grip control. Many Bronze Age hilts and grip shapes tell your hand where to sit. Some are narrow, some have swelling sections, some rely on organic materials like wood, bone, horn, leather, or cord wrapping that create a natural stop. That kind of grip design is doing a quiet job that a later cross guard does loudly. So when you pick up a Bronze Age sword and think, this looks underbuilt, it might be that you're judging it by the rules of a later style of fighting. In the Middle Ages, especially once you get into more specialized armored combat and later weapon traditions, swords are asked to do more different jobs, sometimes without a big shield, sometimes with a small buckler, sometimes in two hands, sometimes in close wrestling range. Different job description, different safety features. Bronze Age swords were often built around a simpler idea. Keep the weapon fast, keep the grip stable, keep the hand behind the shield, and don't waste metal on parts you're not relying on. Number three, most threats weren't sliding sword parries. People love imagining Bronze Age duels as sword versus sword because swords are cool and they survive in museums. But on an actual battlefield, whether you're talking Bronze Age war in Europe or later war in the Middle Ages, most of the danger doesn't come from a neat, clean sword exchange. It comes from messy, common weapons and messy, common actions. Spears are cheap, 
long, and brutally effective. Clubs, axes, and maces exist in some form basically everywhere because they're simple and they work. Even in medieval battles with knights and armored soldiers, plenty of fighting is still spear, polearm, and blunt impact, not just sword fencing. A sword is often a sidearm, the thing you use when the spear is gone, the line is broken, or you're too close for the long weapon to make sense. In that kind of environment, the handguard problem changes. A crossguard is most obviously useful when you're frequently meeting another blade with your blade and letting it slide. But if most of your defensive work is shield first blocking, deflecting, smothering lines of attack with a big piece of wood and hide, then your sword is not constantly acting as the main barrier. It's the tool that strikes around the barrier. And when you do have to use the sword defensively, you're not forced into the specific kind of point up, edge to edge parry that makes sliding into the hand such a big worry. You can angle the blade so contact runs away from your hand. You can knock attacks aside instead of catching them. You can step and turn your shield so the weapon line collapses. That kind of movement, simple, practical, survival first, doesn't need a huge handguard to work. It's also worth remembering that hand protection doesn't only come from the weapon. Gloves exist. Wrappings exist. People toughen hands through work. None of that replaces a guard but it reduces how urgently you feel the need to bolt a big chunk of metal onto the hilt. By the time you hit many medieval contexts, you start seeing more specialized hand protection too, eventually things like gauntlets in certain armored settings. So the swords guard becomes part of a bigger protective package. In the Bronze Age, the bigger protective package was usually simpler. Shield, plus movement, plus not doing unnecessary blade catching in the first place. Number four, Bronze makes long guards awkward. Here's the part that sounds boring until you really picture it. Bronze is not steel. That doesn't mean bronze is useless far from it. Bronze can take a sharp edge, and Bronze Age swords were serious weapons. But bronze behaves differently, and that affects what shapes are practical and durable. A long crossguard sticking out from the hilt creates leverage. If it gets hit, shoved, or twisted, it can bend. With steel, especially later heat-treated steel, you can get springiness and toughness that handles that stress better. With bronze, especially if you're trying to keep the whole weapon reliable, you might avoid thin, protruding parts that love to deform. On top of that, Bronze Age sword construction often isn't one standard system. Some blades are cast in ways that integrate parts of the hilt, then the grip is built up with organic materials and rivets. Some designs are great at being a blade, but adding a big separate guard can complicate the joint between blade and handle, exactly the place you least want complicated stress. So a small flare or minimal guard-like shaping can be a smart compromise. It gives you a stop, it gives your knuckles a tiny bumper, but it doesn't turn into a fragile antenna that gets bent the first time someone crashes a shield into you. There's also the reality of manufacturing and repair. Bronze is valuable. Casting is skilled work. If you add extra mass and shape to the hilt, you're adding cost, time, and risk of defects. And if that fancy cross piece gets bent, you might not unbend it neatly without weakening it. In a world where resources matter, and a weapon might be a major investment, you design for what you truly need, not what looks impressive to someone two or three thousand years later. This is where the medieval comparison helps again. In the Middle Ages, once iron and steel production evolves and spreads, and once you have different fighting habits, the idea of a longer guard starts to make more sense mechanically. Steel lets you do slimmer, tougher projections that survive impacts better. So when people ask, why didn't Bronze Age swords look like medieval swords? A very practical answer is, because they weren't made of medieval materials, and they weren't expected to survive medieval style stresses in the same way. Number five, their defensive habits likely avoided blade sliding. Without fight manuals from most of Bronze Age Europe, we can't point to a page and say, here's the exact guard position they used. But we can still reason from physics, tool design, and what later sword traditions teach about what works. One big idea, if you don't have a long crossguard, you quickly learn not to defend in ways that require a long crossguard. That sounds obvious, but it's important. If you set your blade upright and let another blade slide straight down towards your hand, you're basically betting your fingers on a feature you don't have. 
people who survive fights tend to stop making bets like that. So what are the alternatives? Angled defenses are a big one. Instead of meeting force head on, you roof it, tilting your blade so contact runs away from your hand and away from your body. Another is beating attacks aside. You don't catch, you knock. If something comes in, you slap it offline and immediately move. And of course, if you have a shield, you let the shield do the heavy defensive lifting while your sword stays ready to strike. That's not fancy, it's just efficient. This also connects to what we see in later medieval armed combat, especially when shields are in play. Even in medieval contexts, a lot of sword and shield work is about controlling lines with the shield and using the sword to exploit openings, not about long, theatrical blade binds. When you do see lots of sophisticated blade binding and sliding behavior, it often shows up in contexts where both people are relying more heavily on the sword itself for defense like certain two-handed traditions, or when shields are reduced or gone, or when the sword is paired with a small buckler that doesn't hide the whole hand the same way. So it's totally plausible that Bronze Age sword use leaned toward shield-led defense and quick angular sword actions. In that environment, a huge crossguard isn't missing. Faith, it's just unnecessary weight and awkward metal sticking out where it can snag, bend, or get in the way. And once you stop expecting Bronze Age fighters to behave like later medieval fencers, the design starts making sense on its own terms. Number six, when shields changed, guards started to appear. One of the coolest clues in weapon history is that you can sometimes watch design features wake up when conditions change. Bronze Age Europe isn't one single culture or one single century. It's a massive span of time and a patchwork of regions. So you do find variation. Some Bronze Age swords show more pronounced hand protection than others, including early looking cross guard shapes in certain areas. That's not an accident. It's a hint that in those places, the fighting context was shifting. Shield size, shield shape, and how the shield was held can change how exposed the sword hand becomes. A center grip round shield naturally hides the hand a lot of the time, but if you move toward bigger, longer shields, or shields held in a way that sits closer to the body, your sword hand may poke out more often during attacks. If the hand is showing, people start wanting more hardware in front of it. Now compare that to medieval Europe. In many early medieval settings, you still have round shields and swords with relatively short guards. As time goes on, you see more strapped shields like kite shields and later heater shields and also changing battlefield roles and techniques. You don't need an exact one date when it happened. The trend is what matters. As the shield no longer automatically covers the sword hand in every moment, swords tend to grow more obvious guarding features. Later still, when you get to Eris where the shield is smaller, optional, or replaced by two-handed weapons and different formations, hand protection evolves again. Sometimes longer cross guards, sometimes rings, sometimes full-on basket hilts in much later periods. So Bronze Age swords with minimal guards aren't behind. They're tuned to a world where the shield is the real wall and the sword is the fast tool working behind it. The moment that wall changes shape or use, the sword starts picking up more of the job. Number seven, balance, speed, and cost mattered more than style. There's a simple trade that weapon makers have always lived with. Every gram of metal you add has consequences. Add more handguard and you add weight. Weight changes handling. Handling changes what people can do under stress. In a lot of Bronze Age swords, the feel is quick and direct. They often want to accelerate fast, hit hard, and recover fast. A big chunk of metal at the hilt can shift balance back and change how the sword tracks through a cut. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's exactly what you don't want. And in a world where the sword is not your only defensive tool again, shield first, the argument for extra metal gets weaker. Then there's cost. Bronze is an alloy that depends on trade networks, especially for tin. That means bronze objects are connected to supply, status, and economy in a way many people underestimate. A sword can be a prestige item, it can be a serious investment, and it can also be something you don't want to overcomplicate. If a weapon is already expensive and valuable, you might prioritize a strong blade and a reliable grip over extra features that mostly solve a problem your shield already solves. There's also the snag factor. 
Big guards catch on clothing, straps, shield rims, and other gear. That's annoying in modern reenactment. It's dangerous in a real fight. Minimal guards are clean. They stay out of the way. They don't hook on things when you're trying to move through a crowd, step past a shield edge, or pull your sword back quickly. Medieval soldiers and knights eventually accept bigger guards because they're getting benefits that outweigh the costs in their specific context. But Bronze Age weapon makers were optimizing for their context. Speed, simplicity, durability, and not wasting material where it doesn't change survival odds much. Number eight, we judge Bronze Age swords through medieval eyes. The biggest reason this question even exists is that our mental default sword is usually medieval or even later. We picture a knight's arming sword with a cross guard, or we picture a longsword used in armored combat, or we picture a rapier with complex hand protection. And then we look at a Bronze Age sword and it feels like it's missing a safety feature. But that's like looking at a rowing boat and asking why it doesn't have a steering wheel. Different tool, different system. Medieval battles, medieval armies, and the life of a knight create different problems. Armor changes, tactics change, shields change, fighting ranges change. Once you're in a world where swords are used more often without a big shield doing all the hiding, the sword itself has to start acting like a protective device, not just an attacking one. That's where cross guards start to feel non-negotiable. In Bronze Age conditions, the sword is more like a fast sidearm that works with a shield and around a shield. It doesn't need to be a miniature barricade. It needs to be a reliable cutter and thruster that doesn't waste weight and doesn't break at the hilt. And honestly, it's kind of a trap to assume more complex equals more advanced. Sometimes the most advanced design is the one that removes anything you don't absolutely need. If your hand is usually hidden behind a boss grip shield, if your defensive habit is angled contact and shield control rather than long blade binds, if your material punishes thin protruding parts, and if your economy makes extra bronze a serious choice, then a small guard stops looking like a flaw. It starts looking like someone understood their battlefield reality really well, right down to where their knuckles actually were when the fight got crowded.